So I want to welcome right now Tim Ballard. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for having me. I am, um, I'm, I'm fueling this talk on Red Bull. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. I haven't slept. Um, uh, I, I finally got eight hours. Um, it took me three days, but I got eight hours. So, um, this is, this is, this is a tough topic. I know child trafficking, the slavery of human beings, of children, and. Uh, I'm just going to throw some stats out so you understand what we're talking about. 30 million people enslaved today. 6 million children. By slavery, by the way, human trafficking is slavery. These are people who do not own their bodies. Their bodies are owned by somebody else, and they're used for sex, for labor, for organ harvesting. I'm, I'm heading this week out to the Middle East where we're running operations, pulling kids out from, from remnants of ISIS who've taken them. Um, there are uh, 6 million children forced into one of those categories. Uh, there's 10,000 children every year forced into the United States, forced into the commercial sex trade right here. So this is not a peripheral issue. It's a big problem. It's, it's horrendous. And I always fear standing before a crowd like this, thinking I'm going to just bring the room down and all this happy energy, and I'm just going to destroy it all by talking about something so dark. Uh, but... The message, I think, is one of, of light and hope in the end, and that's what I hope to deliver. Um, in fact, um, I hope to even provide applicable uh, lessons from th that I have learned running operations undercover throughout the world that I think are applicable to anything you're doing at, at home, in your businesses, uh, in, in, these, in these real estate endeavors that you're learning about. Uh, and so I want to talk about this. It's, it's a particular principle that I've learned from my heroes. I'm going to talk about some of my heroes that I've learned working uh, in, in, in these anti-trafficking efforts. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's the, um, it's, to me, it's a secret, it's almost a secret principle that is the success to life that I feel like I've, I've, I've learned what it is. Uh, to, to, to help you understand, I'm going to take you back to 2006. Uh, I was working a case you're going to see some real footage from this case. I was on the border of Calexico, California, and Mexicali, and we identified an individual named Earl Buchanan, this American man who was kidnapping children in Mexico, smuggling them into the United States, and making child pornography out of his makeshift studio in San Bernardino, California. A five-year-old boy was rescued at the port of entry, and... From there, the case blew wide open, and we found 12 children in California who were being abused in this way. This guy had a, a, a house and a studio full of pornography and toys to kind of uh, lure these children, to desensitize these children. It was one of the first cases that I had worked that I saw the child that I recognized from the child porn that I was investigating, and it almost broke me. And at the end of that case, I was driving home, 48 hours, hadn't slept, Red Bull hadn't been invented yet, and I was driving home, and where I lived in this little border town of El Centro, California, there's two off-ramps. One off-ramp would have taken me to where the little boy was recovering, uh, where the little boy was, was we were looking for a family to take him, and just, he was healing. The next off-ramp, being the town is so small, was my home, where I would get off to go home. And I played this little game with myself. I said, if I get off to see the little boy, I'm going to stay in this fight. If I skip the off-ramp and take my home off-ramp, I'm done. I'm, I'm turning in my badge. I'm going to go do something else. Because I, and, I was, and that's the option I wanted. I didn't want to hurt anymore. After seeing what I had seen on this case, I was just done. And I'm driving along, and... I'm thinking I'm going to skip that off-ramp. And I hear this song, a Peter Brianholt song, if for those local Utahns who know about Peter Brianholt, uh, that's called Lullaby. It's a song that, that talks about um, a parent figure coming to the rescue of, to the nightmare of this child. And I felt it was almost providential in that moment. And I, it was that song that made me turn off, and I went to where I didn't want to go. 
I went to go see that little boy. But something happened in that moment that was incomprehensible to me until a few years later. Right as I turned, I felt this wave of happiness. I felt optimism. I felt hope. I felt courage. I felt creativity about how I could investigate this case better. I thought, what's happening? What did I do by turning off that created this? It was years later uh, when I found out what it was. And it's something that we can all tap into. And the person who taught it to me is a guy you probably heard of named Tony Robbins. Uh, Tony Robbins uh, is, a, is one of the, he is probably the single biggest donor to Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, Tony even went undercover with us because he wanted to see firsthand what happens to, to, to victims of, of, of trafficking. Uh, how do you disguise a guy like Tony Robbins, though? So we, had, we actually brought, that's him right there, there he is. I, we, and that's me. So that's him and I about to meet traffickers. He, he was, we kind of put him back a little bit so he didn't have firsthand, but he, he was there, he saw it. Uh, so later on, um, Tony came and, and he helped a lot of our aftercare centers. And, and I watched Tony uh, go into our aftercare centers. I was just taking him there to, he'd already given so much money that we had passed on. He couldn't help just throwing just thousands, tens of, of thousands of dollars everywhere we went, quietly. I want to help more. How can I help this and this? Every place I took him. Uh, one of the places that we took him to was a, an orphanage in Haiti where uh, I had two children that we were adopting that were there. And I was worried about them in this orphanage. It, uh, adoptions can take years. And he did something that I caught secretly. And I'm going to let him say what it was. I, I was at his home uh, not too long ago promoting my new book, Slave Stealers. Uh, and he interviewed me. Um, and I, I'm going to run this video. You can, this is me actually telling him that I caught him doing something, and you can watch his reaction. And if I can share this story, um, um, this thing happened, you didn't even know this had happened until six months later, I emailed you at Christmas. Yeah, that's, that's I remember, yeah. When you were with me, and we were, we were um, seeing those kids, and it broke my heart, because at this point, they're my kids. I know. And I love them, like my kids. I know. And imagine leaving your kids. It's, they're, now they're in, a, you know, they were in an orphanage that was, it was good. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, they weren't selling them, but it's no. still an orphanage in Haiti, right? Yeah. And, and I, I remember flying away every time just thinking, are they okay? Like, God, please take care of them. I can't, I don't know if they really have food, if they really, you know, you don't know what, what mm. they're telling you. And while we were there, something happened that I didn't tell you about until six months later, but I watched you. Um, you walked away with the director of the orphanage. Yeah. And I snuck, you didn't know this, but I snuck around the other side. I'm like, what's Tony going to say to her, you know? I'm just yeah. curious. I probably shouldn't have done it, but I just, you know, I'm, it's my spy side. I'm just, so I'm on the other side of the wall listening and falling to pieces um, because you said to her, what does it cost to run this place? And she gave you the, the amount for the year, and you said, I'm going to fund this for two years. And I knew... I didn't know those were your kids at the time. What you were doing for me was... My kids are going to be okay. I will have them in two years at least. So I know they're good until I get them. And, and I couldn't even talk to you about it. because I, 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 I didn't even know until <laughs> <didn't> <laughs> this moment. <laughs> That's beautiful. And, uh, so, You're such a good soul, man. So you, you, what you did for me and my wife in that moment, and it, it took me six months to even be able to tell you that. Yeah, I, I didn't make the connection. I knew that, you know, I supported the center, but I didn't realize we'd met so many kids. I yeah. didn't realize at that point that those are the ones you were going to adopt. So. Yeah, I think my kids were the ones climbing on your head. <laughs> yes, I remember you, you, that. They were climbing Mount Tony. They are having a blast. <laughs> I had a blast. It was beautiful. I think, as I'm watching that, I think two of my heads would fit into his head. <laughs> did, did anyone else get that? Like that? <laughs> it's like a different species. Um, so these are my two kids with, with Tony. And I'm going to come back to that story in a second. But the point I want to make is after the cameras went down and we, I was talking to him, I said, what is, why do you do, I mean, why do you give, you give so much and then you give more. Like, what is it? Because that's, that's kind of unusual. And he said, you know what, I'm going to tell you why. Um, come into my office, we're going to close the door, and I'm going to tell you why, but I'm going to, in order to explain why I do that, I need to give you, his exact words, I need to give you a blessing in my office behind closed doors. Um, and I'm th thinking about this, and my, anyone seen the movie Shallow Hell? 
The, the elevator scene with Jack Black. I, I'm thinking I'm about to get the elevator scene with Jack Black. Okay, a blessing behind closed doors. If you haven't seen Shallow Hal for a while, let me just show this clip for you, and you can see what's running through my mind as Tony Robbins wants to have a, a blessing. <laughs> yeah, I got one. Girls, come out! What the hell are you doing, banana hands? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's not exactly what happened, but he sits me down, and he goes through this meditation prayer kind of thing with me, but the whole point of it is to get me to think about giving, service, giving, gratitude, service, times that I served, times that others served me. And all of a sudden, as I just thought about those moments in my life, I was filled with something that I recognized. It was the same thing I recognized when I had gotten off on the freeway, off the off-ramp, to go visit this little boy. I felt optimism. I mean, I was in tears. I was just like floating. I feel like I wanted to go run a marathon from his house. I was like, what is this? I felt optimism. I felt courage unity, these amazing things. I said, what is this? He says, Tim, it's a chemical reaction. It's a chemical, re when you give, when you serve, your brain actually releases these amazing chemicals, oxytocin, um, dopamine, endorphins, serotonin. And, and it's what, and on, if, if, you're, if you're a spiritual person like he is, he says, these are the chemicals God puts in your body that opens up the heavens, that helps you to get past the physical and into the spiritual. But whether you believe that or not, the reaction, the fruit of this is real. So I, I, I wanted to do my own research on it, and I, and I found a, a brain specialist, one of the people that helps us res, uh, heal the brain of the children who have been traumatized. His name's Tom Harrison, and this is what he says, his research. The research is conclusive. Through ongoing acts of service, charity, thoughts of kindness, and gratitude, the brain releases a powerful cocktail of chemicals, which include oxytocin, endorphins, dopamine, and others. These chemicals, in turn, produce in the recipient positive benefits, which produce higher levels of achievement, increased creativity, positivity, optimism, and in unity. Why are these fruits so important? Because you can't teach these things in your home, to your children, in your businesses, to your employees? Can you go to your employee and say, all right, be creative? I mean, you can say it. Be optimistic. Be a unifier. Be a t team unity. You can say it all day long, but how do, they, it's, how do I do it? How do I be creative? How do I just do this? You do it by creating the environment in which service is, is prominent, is paramount. You, you encourage your people, your family, to serve others. This is why Tony Robbins is always saying, the secret to living is giving. That's his like, life mantra. And that's why he gives so much, because he, he'll tell you, I receive way more than I give. I get all these amazing fruits. And as I learned this principle, I began to apply it more in my operations, let me give you an example of an, of, of an operation where this principle worked for me. It was one of the very first operations we did at OUR. What, what had happened was um, I had done a training as a government agent in Bogota, Colombia. Trained a bunch of uh, Colombian agents on how to infiltrate child trafficking rings. And I was tired of the training that I'd been doing, the same check the box training that I'd done so many times. I don't think anyone was listening. And so when the, when the State Department minder left the room, I shut down the laptop and I said, we're not doing the training that I was supposed to do. We're going to do a real case. We're going we're gonna to take three days and plan an operation and rescue children. So we decided, I asked them, where are the kids being, being hurt? Where are the kids being trafficked? They said, Cartagena, Colombia. Why? Sad commentary on our country. Because that's where the Americans come in on their cruise ships. Because the Americans, uh, the United States is the number one consumer of child pornography and child sex in the world. So we are the clients. And so as such, they said, Tim, we need you to come undercover. We need you to bring a bunch of American guys who can play the role of the American sex tourist and infiltrate these, these trafficking rings. I said, yes, let's do it. I was saying yes to everything. I was writing checks that I had no authorization to write, in essence. I, I committed $100,000 of the U.S. 
government resources and 10 agents for two months to do this operation. And as I got on the plane and flew home, I thought, what have I done? I have zero authority to do this. And my boss reminded me of that in, in, in a not nice conversation uh, the next day when he asked me how things went. So I was stuck. What do I do? Another thing was happening in Haiti at the same time where I also made a, a promise that I shouldn't have made. And, so those, and I'll get to that in a second. But those things were weighing on me. And I decided the only way to fulfill my promise is to quit my job and go about it as a private entity where I don't have jurisdictional limitations. And so we did the operation. Now, the re I'm not a master at this principle, by the way. So, but, but in this case, it was interesting because I had no competing incentives uh, when I did this operation. It was only about service. I wasn't trying to you know, please my boss or look for a raise or look for a cash award for my great work. I, that wasn't an option for me. The only option I had once I quit my job and went in to help the Colombians was service. And this was the case of all cases where I ex experienced the fruit of having that pure intent. Let me give you an example. So I meet these traffickers. I go on the beach. I go on this little beach called Baru, the, the Baru Islands. I sit on the beach, and the Colombian cops are just acting like my tour guide or my, my uh, taxi driver. And I just sit there with, a, with sunglasses that have a camera in it. And within 20 minutes, I get approached by this guy named Fuego, okay, who offers me children, 11, 12 years old. So Fuego introduces me to his boss, Eduardo, and now we're negotiating a, a sex party. He's going to bring the 15 kids he's, he controls. And I'm meeting with Eduardo, and usually I would have said, that's enough. Now, these undercover meetings are very intense. I'm in Eduardo's house. He's got armed thugs all around. I have nothing. I have a, I have a, I'm, I'm wired. All I have is my voice and my, and my verbal judo to keep me safe. Because if he finds out who I am, I'm, I'm, I'm dead. I'm, I'm in Colombia in this little, in this house but with all these armed guys. The cops are, there's cops undercover outside, but they don't travel as fast as bullets, unfortunately. So I, 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 that's the situation. So usually I'm not trying to like, and when, I, and when I've been in these situations, I don't usually try to, it's, it's hard enough just to keep that conversation going, get the deal done and get out of there. But instead, I was feeling these fruits of optimism and courage and creativity and I was able to expand my conversation with him because I thought, I don't want to rescue just 15 kids. I want to rescue 100 kids. But that would require Eduardo to bring his competitors into the game. And so I said to him, hey, you know what, Eduardo? I don't just want a sex party. I want to be a business partner. Do you know how many pedophiles I have who will come down with me that we can, we can cater to? I'll bring, I'll bring the guys. You bring the, 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 the products. And I know that's horrible, and it sounds horrible, but this is how we have to talk to these guys. And let's do something. So he looks at me. And he's like, all right, I'll let you in on my, little, on my business plan. He opens up the books and explains to me that he's in the process of building a child sex hotel out on, these, on, on the Baru Island, which is about a, an hour boat ride out of, off of Cartagena. And he says, I need a million dollars to finish the hotel. It'll look like a hotel to any passerbys, but inside it's, it's just kids. And, and the Americans, you guys can come. And I said, great. I'll give you a million dollars, but 15 kids, that's not enough because that's not, that's not productive enough. I said, I want at least 50. And he says, well, then I'd have to call other people. I said, then you call other people. And he did what I hoped. He called every trafficker, all his competitors into the room, including this woman named Kelly Suarez, Miss Cartagena 2012, this beautiful woman who was famous in town. And she had a modeling school. She used her modeling school um, as a ploy to lure 9- and 10-year-old girls and, and boys, giving them scholarships to her school where she would take them and then desensitize them, give them, porno give them porn, give them drugs, and then tell them that part of your job is to go into this room with this man and, and do what you just saw in the videos. So they all got together, and we ended up doing this deal. The day of the operation, we're on the island near the property where we're going to build a hotel, and they brought 50 kids for us to try the product, to try out the product and, and make the, the initial deal. And again, we, I, can, I find myself in this crazy situation because what happens when we do operations, the aftercare site is the most important. The kids have to, somewhere to go. They need to have somewhere to go to heal. And so when, we, when the cops raid and do the arrests, the aftercare specialists need to be right on their heels 
so the kids know right away, you're not in trouble, we're, you're, you're, you're good, we're the good guys, we're here to help you because they're confused. And we're doing this negotiation, everything's good, they, the money's transferred, and the Colombian cops feel like we've got enough, and they, they give the keyword because we're running live radio to the cops in the boats, the arrest team, and they say the key word, which is, he lifts up his glasses and says, bring out the wine. The cops are supposed to hear that, and, uh, and then they come, and within a minute, the arrest happens, and we get out, out of there. So the deal's done. We have nothing else to talk about. And he says, bring out the wine. And the cops don't come. And finally, we get messages on our cell phones. We can't come. The boat with the aftercare specialists broke down. And we will not raid them unless the, the, the specialists are there. Now, you understand our predicament. Because these, these, these traffickers are now saying, take the girls. You got the rooms. You got, take them. And obviously, we can't take them. But if we don't take them, what's going on? And it was a scary, intense moment. But again, like never, like never before in my life, I felt what I couldn't teach myself on my own. Creativity, courage, optimism. Because this was an act of service. And so we had this idea. And we all, it wasn't just me, my whole team who, who made these sacrifices as well. It's like we all almost had the same idea at the same time and just went with it. So what I did was I said, okay, listen, we're going to split the revenues on this hotel. And, you know, you might think it's none of my business how you six traffickers are going to split your 50%. But it is my business. Because if, if, if you're fighting amongst yourselves about who gets what, that's going to hurt us. Because you, we need to know that you guys are together. And so I, I'd like to know how you're going to split you're fifty percent amongst each other. They said, "Oh, it's going to be e- it's just even all the way through." I said, mm. "I said that's not a good idea, because Kelly Suarez is a lot more effective at this than you guys are." So I think Kelly, I'd feel more I'd feel more comfortable if Kelly got eighty percent of your fifty percent. <laughs> can, can you guess what happened? <laughs> These guys then t- Kelly goes, "Yeah." <laughs> it's like yes. It's like what are you talking about? All of a sudden, these guys are at each other's throats. And they're fighting. I don't have to. We just sit back and just watch for 20 minutes as they fight and say, I deserve this. I, I mean, they're about to go to blows with each other. They're still fighting as I see peripherally the, 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 cop, the, 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 the speedboats coming in with the, with the arrest team. So it works. It worked. It worked. Um, CBS News embedded with us on this operation. I have a three minute clip so you can actually watch the real thing go down. This is the CBS Evening News with Scott Perry. Dozens of children were saved from slavery when agents rushed in to break up a sex trafficking ring. Last weekend, police broke up a major sex trafficking ring in Colombia, which has become a destination for tourists looking for sex with boys and girls. The police had help from an American who went undercover to rescue the children, and Elaine Quijano met him. Tim Ballard has one mission, to track down child traffickers. Four months ago, Colombian authorities asked him to investigate a tip that children were being sold there as sex slaves. Within a half hour, this individual walks up to me, starts asking me what I'm here for, what I want, and within minutes, he says, well, I've got got kids as young as 11 years old. Ballard, a former Homeland Security agent, now heads up Operation Underground Railroad, a nonprofit group that rescues trafficked kids. After that first meeting, the Colombians asked him to put together a sting. No men will be in here, only women. Operation Underground Railroad spent months planning, renting this house, rigging it with hidden cameras to document the crime, coordinating with Colombian authorities, and negotiating with the traffickers. How they find these kids is they lure them in by pretending to have a modeling agency. They target them at 9 or 10 years old. And they were telling us that about by 11, they're ready for sex. They're ready to be sold. What is that like, looking into that kind of person's eyes? It's horrifying, and this is why. Because 
I've got a smile in the face of evil. This is the table where we're going to do the negotiation. Less than 24 hours after the operatives landed, the suspected traffickers arrived on the island, and the final deal with the undercover team began. 54 boys and girls aged 11 to 18 were ushered in for what had been billed as a sex party. They were given candy and drinks and told to wait in this small room. This, this little 11 year old boy, I remember, he asked one of my operatives if they could give him some cocaine or something. But he said, they usually give me something because I'm really scared. By the time the deal was done, the alleged traffickers were set to make $25,000. That transaction was never completed. 25 Colombian special operatives stormed the party, arresting five suspects, four men, and one former beauty queen, all charged with child trafficking. The victims, 29 of whom are under 18, were evacuated, given medical exams, and placed in a rehabilitation center where specialists are working to undo the damage. Right before I got in the boat, we had to walk by the this room where the kids were, and they put their hand up. And I touched their hand and see that there's liberation now. Liberating one child at a time. Elaine Quijano, CBS News, New York. And we'll be right back. Today we're, you know, th th these are our first, this is our first operation. Um, today we're in 20 countries, 22 states in the United States, doing these kind of operations all around. Um, uh, but this, this, this was that, that very first one. And in fact, um, uh, I want to share something with you because I can't, we can't distribute this online. This, there's no other way to see it except in private settings. Um, this story, uh, you know, after the dust settled and we got to learn the stories of the individual kids, there's so much, there's so much more that happened here. It, we actually rescued 120 kids in total in, in three hours. You're just seeing a little piece of the story. I, I can't even get into the whole thing, how crazy it got. Uh, we were approached by 20th Century Fox several years ago to do a movie a feature film based on, based on this story and based on the OUR story. And uh, I never thought that it would come to anything, uh, but they, they did it. And they, they filmed this last, this last summer. Uh, I think it comes out this December. Uh, it's, it stars Jim Caviezel. You know who Jim Caviezel is? He plays Jesus in The Passion of the Christ and uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. Um, he, they had to, he had to dye his hair because he's got jet black hair in real life. And then that's Mira Servino, Academy Award winner. Uh, she plays my wife. Um, this is on the set. So this hasn't even been announced officially. They haven't even put together a trailer, but 20th Century Fox sent over some footage just so they can show me, like, hey, just so you know how it went. You know, here's, you can get a feel for how the movie's going to look and feel. Um, and it's totally, they said, don't show anybody. This is just for your eyes. And so I'm totally going to violate. Like, I didn't say yes. I didn't agree to it. I just, <laughs> I just said, I said, okay, I understood. Um, anyway, so you, I'm gonna, I want to show you, uh, just so you can get an idea, and now that you know the story a little bit, you can kind of catch the scenes that you just saw, the real scenes. Uh, in, interestingly, I, I'm in the middle of the trial against Kelly Suarez and these, and these other traffickers. It's happening right now. So, I, and, and the stars align strangely, because I, I went on set like once in Colombia, twice maybe. Um, but once in Cartagena, I went on the set to watch them film, and it happened to line up with me when I needed to testify at, in the trial. So I'm literally watching this woman who looks just like Kelly Suarez and, and replaying the whole e event through this filming and then tr driving an hour from there to the courtroom and actually testifying. And it was a very surreal experience. Um, but this is, this is The Sound of Freedom and just uh, some various clips from that movie which I think will come out later this year. Timoteo, the kid, Miguel, is back with his father, right? 
Yes. How'd that make you feel? Giving a child his freedom. Good. What kind of good are we talking about? Brings hope. Why are you doing it? Because God's children are not for sale. <laughs> This job tears you to pieces. And this is my one chance to put those pieces back together. I want to tell you about um, one of my uh, other, one of my great heroes who taught me this principle, how service is so effective uh, in, 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 in turning uh, the lights on in the dark, of bringing optimism when there, when there is no hope. Uh, the same principle that Tony Robbins taught me. His name is Gesno Marty. Gesno Marty is a man who I met many years ago and was a lot of the reason that we started Operation Underground Railroad in the first place. This man is a Haitian man. He has several children, one of which was born here in Utah. His name was Gardy, U.S. citizen. Little Gardy was uh, here for a time and then moved back to Haiti. And little Gardy was kidnapped from the church where his father was the, an LDS bishop in, in Port-au-Prince. Kidnapped by traffickers and, uh, and, and taken. Now, this is something that happens often in, in a place like Haiti. And uh, when I learned about the case, I decided that I wanted to help him find his son. And uh, it was the other reason that I left. I couldn't do it as a U.S. agent. It wasn't a U.S. case. And um, the, interesting, the interesting thing about this man is the first time I met him, this is his son, this is Gardy. Take, these pictures are taken just a few weeks before he was taken. Um, 
when you see this man's face, this is him always. He's smiling. He's happy. He's, um, he, uh, he has a light. And, and it was so unusual to me because I thought, how do you have this light when you're going through the worst hell imaginable? And I wanted that light. I wanted to be like him. Um, when I first met him, he explained to me that when I asked him what was being done to find his son, he said, he said nothing except that I walk the streets of Port-au-Prince every night hoping and praying that I'll hear my son cry. He asked me, he said, he said, do you have children? I said, yes. He said, could you sleep at night knowing that one of your children's beds was empty? And I said, no, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. And and uh, he says, well, I can't either, so that's why I spend my nights walking, hoping. I promised him we'd, we would do everything we could to find his son. And so after we went from, from Columbia, the second operation that we did as a foundation was to find this little boy. And we found his captors. We, we dug into the case file. The police worked with us, and we figured out who did this to him. And it's a typical tactic that these traffickers use. In this case, they, they throw up a sign that says orphanage and abandoned children, especially after the big earthquakes and hurricanes. There's abandoned children everywhere. And decent people take them to the orphanage because it says orphanage. But they're traffickers. And they take those kids in with a smiling face and they sell them on the black market. And the Haitian police and, and our foundation identified what that orphanage was where, where we thought Gardy was. And so they asked us if we would go do an, a sting operation, go undercover and go into this place and find Gardy. And if they were selling kids, let them sell us kids. So um, as I tell this story, you're going to see the actual footage from our undercover cameras of doing this. So I went undercover, pretending to be a trafficker. Within five minutes, the people at the orphanage are telling me, these kids are for sale. They're $10,000. Pick whichever one you want. Here's how to, you evade a police. Here's how you get around the system, blah, 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 all these things. And I'm just, I can't believe this. I can't find Guardy. I'm looking around. There's 28 beautiful children. I don't know which one is Guardy, if he's there. Uh, but I do have this experience with this little boy who walks up to me. And I pick him up, and something tells me he's the one you have to buy in the sting operation. I didn't know why. It shouldn't have mattered. I, I just had to buy anyone. I, I find out a little bit later that his, he has a little sister, because this little girl, as I'm holding this little boy, this little girl is following around with this scared look in her eyes. And it occurred to me, well, what, what happened was I, I, I wanted her to go away. I'm holding this little boy, looking for Guardy, pretending like I'm, you know, doing my thing while my colleagues are keeping the traffickers busy, and I don't want these kids to be following me. So, so I give, I give, um, I give this little girl a candy bar. Now, these kids are all on the verge of starvation. And uh, I give this little kid a candy bar, and she does something that Kids don't do, okay, especially starving kids. She takes it without taking her eyes off the little boy and breaks the candy bar in half and places the other half into the hands of the little boy. And I knew in that instant their brother and sister. And I put him down and I grabbed her hand and he grabbed, she grabbed his hand once I put him down. And she's terrified and I realized what she's thinking. How many Americans have come here and picked up a child and that child's gone forever? And she's not going to let that happen to her little brother. So I tell them both that you, who I am, that they're going to be together, and I'll make sure they stay together forever. And she understood. She believed me. And we did the operation. We end up buying these kids in a, in a, at a hotel nearby, exchange the money. These are, this is the actual deal we're making. Once the money was transferred, the police came in. Beautiful operation. Everyone arrested. We get arrested, too to kind of to keep our cover. That's me getting arrested. And so it was a great operation. We took down the ring, except that as we processed and identified all the kids, we realized that Gardy was not there. Gardy had already been sold. 
And I had to go tell Gesno, his father, the most difficult conversation I've ever had. I couldn't, he was, he was at, a, at a different hotel waiting for the results, praying that his son would be found. I couldn't, I kept calling his cell phone and he, it wasn't working for whatever reason. So I went in person, went to the hotel. I walked in, he saw me, I saw him, and no words were necessary. He could tell by the look on my eyes and he just broke down. And I broke down. His son wasn't there. I eked out the words, we did get the 28, but your son wasn't there. And it was just, it was horrible. But it only lasted for about 20 seconds, this moment of emotion with him. And then he pops his head up and he puts that classic light back on his face. And he's smiling and he says, stop, stop. He says, you don't have to be sad about this. I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, Tim, 28 kids were rescued. I said, yeah, I'm worried about the one that wasn't. He says, you're missing the point. These 28 kids wouldn't have been rescued if my son hadn't been kidnapped because you, wouldn't have been, you guys wouldn't have come. And then he said maybe the most profound thing anyone's ever said to me. He said, if I have to give up my son so that these 28 kids can be rescued, that is a burden I'm willing to bear. And then to prove he believed that and meant that, the next day he went to the police and he told them, if you can't find the parents of these 28 children, I will bring them home. These children rescued in the name of my son, I will be their father and my wife will be their mother. And in a place like Haiti where resources are scarce, the police took him up on that offer and eight of those kids went home that very day with him. And by the way, he didn't know how he was going to finance the, the lives of these kids. He didn't know that we were going to be able to come in and, and take care of them financially. He just did it. It was irrational service. That's the term I've, I've given it. Irrational service. And it's beautiful. But the more important lesson for me was, oh my gosh, it's the Tony Robbins principle. This guy is in hell. His baby has been taken. And by the way, two weeks after his son was taken, he's looking for his son and the earthquake hits and kills his mother, kills his sister, kills his brother and his best friend. All while he's looking for his son. Just to make matters even worse. He was in hell. He couldn't be in a lower place. And then I discovered why it was that notwithstanding that darkness that surrounded him, he had light. I knew why he had light. Because service turns the lights on. Service creates the reactions, physical and spiritual, that allow him to have courage, to be optimistic, to be creative. And then I learned this lesson yet again, same lesson. I just told you the heroic actions of this little girl, my, my daughter. Um, their names are Kolei and Colleen. They actually, it took us several years. You heard me refer to them with Tony, um, but they just came home last March. It's almost been a year since they've been home, and it's just been a, an amazing blessing. Um, but I want to tell you about this little girl. Because she was also in a dark place. Imagine a two-year-old child, a two-year-old being thrust into a situation where the only adults in her life are trying to sell her. And she has a little brother who's one. That's where they started their journey. Their parents were killed in the earthquake. And some kind person thought they were doing good by taking them to the local orphanage. I mean, that's, look, look how little they are. This, this, is, this is the day of the operation. This is when she gave him the candy bar. She's not only his sister, she is his mother. How can she do that? Well, let me tell you how she did it. The candy bar was a hint, what she did there. Now that they're in a good orphanage, I would go see them often. One time I went to go see them, and she, um, she comes to me, and it's so funny, these kids are so funny. The first time I saw them, after the operation, they ran to me and, and, and they throw their hands in the air and say, Papa Blanc, Papa Blanc. That means white daddy. <laughs> I, that, that's, that was just what they threw, out, threw at me. I was like, what? what? 
I, told, I called my wife and I said, I don't think that our kids are exactly politically correct. Um, we, it, it, took, it took some time after they were home. They kept calling me Papa Blanc. I said, guys, you got to stop. I'm just daddy now, okay? So she comes to me, Papa Blanc, Papa Blanc. I'm going to visit them in the orphanage shortly after the operation was down, and they're in a good place now. And she comes into my backpack, and she takes out a, a box of, of protein bars. And um, she takes those protein bars and runs them into the house. Runs them into the, to the, um, the, the orphanage house. And, and the director of aftercare who's with me says to me, I think that... Uh, um, I think that your, that your daughter is going to, she's a hoarder, I think, you know, and I said, what's that? She said, well, you know, when kids go through a time in their lives when they didn't know when they were going to eat, even when there's an abundance of food, they'll hoard food just in case. So she comes out, shows me the box is empty, and, but she's kind of smiling about it, and I'm like, that's interesting. So I grab her hand, and I say, show me where the chocolate is, and I'm thinking I'm going to find, you know, this maggot-infested nest of food with fresh protein bars poking out the side. But that's not what she took me to see. She ran me upstairs. She opened the door, and I see this beautiful sight. About eight little children, about six, seven years old, who, who were doing schoolwork and now gnawing on the, what they think is a chocolate bar, and they're, they can't figure out why they can't bite into it, because you and I know it, it's not actually a chocolate bar. Um, but one little boy was crying. He didn't have a chocolate bar. And Colleen says to me, Papa Blanc, please go buy one more. I, I didn't have enough for him. Just get me one more. And I, and I honed in on the one more because she didn't have one. I looked at her hands, looked in her pocket. I looked at the, the, the box, counted the number compared to how many kids had bars. She did not care for herself. She did not take, you know, kids are going to take theirs first and then maybe share, right? Opposite with her. Six months later, I give Christmas, we come down, bring, bring Christmas presents for all the, the orphan children. Same thing. She takes all the presents doesn't take any for herself. It gives them all away. And uh, I thought she might do that, so I brought a duffel bag of toys just for her. And I said, listen, these are your... By the way, the little boy, my son, keeps all his stuff, okay? <laughs> but there's a reason, because he was the one that was being protected. He didn't have to learn the lesson that she needed to learn to protect him. So... I bring the duffel bag and say, Colleen, these are just for you. You have to keep these. And she says, okay. And she's looking through them. She's looking at me, looking at the kids who all have toys. And I do this little thing that parents, you know, we parents do. I look away like I'm distracted to see what she'll do. And sure enough, when she thought I was sufficiently distracted, she's dragged that bag into the house and proceeded to give every one of her toys out to the kids again, the kids that already had toys. And then she sits back and just smiles. And I, it hit me again, the same lesson. This little girl needed to learn how to get out of hell. And she needed to make sure her, her, little, her little brother never felt the effects of it. And so she served. Service became her survival mechanism. Now, she couldn't stand here and even articulate to you with words what it was she was doing. But she knew it worked, and so she did it. If I serve, if I serve, two years old, three years old, four years old, she's doing this. If I serve others, put others first, something happens to me. Something happens to my brain. Again, she couldn't articulate this, but she knew it was happening. Something's opening up. A light's coming in. And she used that technique to save her little brother until others came to pull them out. Again, what a lesson for us. I want to show you a video. Um, you might have heard of a singing group called Gentry here from Utah and Madeline Page of The Voice. They came to me a couple years ago and they said, I want to do, we want to do a music video for you. I said, great. They said, give us your footage and we'll just do it. Great. We gave them all, of, we film all of our operations. We do dozens and dozens of operations around the world and we didn't give them direction. And when I saw the final product, I was just shocked. I was stunned. They had even unbeknownst to them, told the story I just told you. You're going to see my kids, their rescue. You're going to see Guess Snow. And even more poignantly, they, the, the songs they chose, it's two songs you recognize both. One is Someone in Darkness, Pleading for Help. 
And then the other song talks about the light. And, I th- and think of Gesno Marty. Think of Colleen, my daughter. And think of how we now know how we can get that light. This is Gentry and Madeline Page. I mean, let's, let's face it. These kids that we're going to save tomorrow, they are on, the, they're on the, 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 the auction block. They're being sold. I want to suggest, because I, I see your reaction to the story and to this, and I want to suggest that, that we might be proving this model right now, right here, the, the, the Tony Robbins model, the secret to living is giving, and this is why, because I've done this presentation so many times, and I know your thoughts right now. Some of you are th- saying and thinking right now, I want to go undercover. I will go undercover right now, and I'll pull those kids out. You're thinking it. That, that's, irras- that's almost as irrational for you to have those thoughts as it was for Gesto Marty to take eight children into his home. 
But the reason you're feeling this is because you're experiencing stories of heroes like Colleen, heroes like Gesno Marty. And I would argue that you are having a shot of this reaction, this beautiful reaction. You're, you're feeling the, the oxytocin and the serotonin come into your system. You're feeling light. Even though it's so irrational that we would put you undercover without knowing what to do. But it proves the model. And you can access it anytime. By creating an environment of service. And I'm not talking about just serving the cause of, of our foundation or even this cause of trafficking. Any cause. Serve people. Make it a part of your, of your professional environment, your family environment. Focus on service. And watch what happens. Watch your creativity, your unity with those you love and work with. Your optimism, your courage. Watch it go through the roof. And then watch the amazing results that follow. Thanks so much for having me come. God bless you.